Everybody knows that we are in a housing crisis and there's a lot of questions about why it exists. Is it because of rich parents hoarding the homes for their kids? Is it because people are trying to buy a second home so they can watch college football? Is it because zoning laws are too restrictive? Is it because of things like NIMBYism, not in my backyard, a group of people who think that the sun revolves around them and them alone and they want their house to be worth a million dollars when they die so they prevent all new development? Or is it because of Wall Street investors? Prices rose 40% from the start of the pandemic. Wall Street landlords. Wall Street landlords. Wall Street landlords. Who did you exploit today? Who did I exploit? Hmm. I don't think I did yet. But are you? Um, yeah, probably sometime today. It's Wall Street. The housing market is the buying, selling, and renting of residential properties. It's influenced by interest rates, economic conditions, government policies, demographics, and more. And the health of the housing market is a barometer for the economy at large. The paper, Housing into the Business Cycle by Edward Lemer, specifically it talks about this. Of the components of GDP, residential investment offers by far the best early warning sign of an oncoming recession. Housing is so important that it actually drove one third of the inflation that we have experienced over the past couple of years. Homes are a big market, the US residential real estate market is worth $43.5 trillion, more than the market cap of the S&P 500 at 36 dollars Point seven trillion. Despite its hugeness, there are not enough homes, and that's the problem. The main issue of the housing crisis is supply and demand. The United States is short about 3.2 million homes. Millennials want to move in, and the boomers don't want to move out. Empty nest baby boomers own 28% of the nation's large homes, while millennials with kids own just 14%. That's one reason why people are living with their parents more, because their parents have the housing. And all of that is exacerbated by Wall Street, these institutional investors. Probably sometime today. Institutional investors are institutions like commercial banks, private equity, and other financial entities that flip homes or rent them out. They like to make money. That's why they exist. That is probably their sole purpose for being on earth, in their opinion, is to make a lot of money. And you can make a lot of money in the housing market. In the United States, there are 146 million homes. 45 million of those are rentals, and 14 million of those are single-family rentals. Everyone's sort of worried about these single-family homes. It's not so much the apartment complexes, but these single family homes. And homeownership is a weird thing because it is the American dream. It's being bought up, hypothetically, by Wall Street. You have a fixed supply of housing. If you have a new buyer, which Wall Street is, you're increasing demand. If you increase demand, you increase price. If you have less demand, the price would go down. So it doesn't really matter what Wall Street does with the house afterwards. The point is they're competing. They're, they're adding is a buyer. Ro Khanna, the U.S. representative for California's 17th district, which covers Silicon Valley and is the wealthiest congressional district in the United States, has put forth a bill called the Stop Wall Street Landlords Act to address how expensive housing has gotten, as well as Wall Street's role within that. You have these Wall Street firms and they're targeting homes that are under $500,000. So in working class, middle class neighborhoods, and they're just buying them up. If you look at this chart, it's one of my favorite charts. It shows that the bottom 50% of Americans, all of their wealth is tied into their house. The top 10%, most of their wealth goes into business ownership, goes into equity, so owning stocks. But for the bottom 50%, that wealth is real estate, and that's the problem. It's making it much harder for ordinary working class, middle class families to buy a house because they're basically bidding against Wall Street. He's putting forth policy that will make it less profitable for Wall Street to invest in single family homes. One day will stop Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae from subsidizing Wall Street's loans. Right now, your tax dollars, my tax dollars, are going to help Wall Street basically buy up these homes. It'll stop that. Basically, the goal is to make it unprofitable so people can get into the housing market a little bit easier. The second thing is it provides a, a, a tax if you buy this home and leave it vacant. That's diminishing the supply and driving up the price. And it prevents them from getting assistance from federal mortgage agencies. Our bill at least stops the federal subsidies, and it also taxes the speculation. So if they're buying up uh, it in cash, and then they're holding the house for a year, year and a half, then there's a vacancy tax that's put on it. But are they probably sometime today really the main issue? I think it's probably more in the camp of overblown. This is Rick Palacios Jr., the director of research at John Burns Research and Consulting. 
He and many others are pointing out that yes, these institutional investors exist, but they're not really circling in the way that we think that they are. They're vultures, but they're not really feasting on the meat yet. We like to think of an institutional investor as a group that owns a thousand plus homes across the country, across their portfolio. When you cut it that way, they really only own a fraction of the single family rental homes out there. So across the country, they own about 3%. If you look at the charts, it's really these people that own one to nine homes that own most of the single family real estate, not Wall Street. It's really the, the small mom and pop landlords that own the lion's share of these rental homes. And so that's, you know, they're a much easier target, but in most cases, they're probably not the right target. But 10 to 99 homes, that might be the right target. It's difficult to figure out who exactly to go after here, but it might not be Wall Street. It's really just your average person that bought their first home and then became an accidental landlord over time and just said, oh, I'm going to rent this, this home out. But the problem with institutional home ownership is that it seems to be growing and it's very concentrated in key cities. If you look at certain jurisdictions like Las Vegas, like Phoenix, uh, like cities in uh, North Carolina, the institutional home ownership is much higher. So six markets, Atlanta, Charlotte, Dallas, Houston, Phoenix, and Tampa are home to 36.8% of all of the nation's institutionally owned single family homes. In Las Vegas, investors were 43% of home purchases, which had begun to decline, giving way to owner occupied purchases. But Tampa is an example of where investors really bit their teeth into it. They own a lot of the city and they own zip codes all near each other, which makes things hard. And there are quite a few housing markets where these institutions own more than 10% of the homes. There's no excuse for this going on in the last uh, few years. The housing shortage really came about during the pandemic, when not a single state added more units than new households. Remote work also caused a boom in the housing demand, explaining why home prices shot up 24% from November 2019 to November 2021. To give you an idea of how bad it is if you're not already aware, researchers found in a 2019 paper that if New York, San Jose, and San Francisco, just those three cities, had their premier Permitting standards of Atlanta or Chicago over the previous several decades, the US economy would have been roughly $2 trillion bigger in 2009. American households would have earned an average of $3,600 more a year. Basically, if these cities were able to build more housing, the economy would be growing faster and people would be making more money. That's why the housing crisis is so important. And to achieve this goal of $3,000 more a month, the cities would have to build 75 million more housing units, which is a tall order because it's not cheap to build homes, especially 75 million of them. New home construction costs are up 3% in the past year and all sorts of things shape how people decide to build homes like home builder confidence, construction costs, construction employment costs. It's expensive to build homes, so people aren't doing it. And we're also not really building the right homes. There are more entry level homes being built, but the homes that are under 1400 square feet or that are less than $300,000 are basically disappearing. And a lot of cities are not building enough homes to match up with job growth. Only 38 metro regions are permitting enough new homes to keep up with their job growth in more than a dozen areas, including New York, the Bay Area, Boston, Los Angeles, Honolulu, Miami, and Chicago. Just one new home is getting built for every 20 plus jobs created. This is an underbuilding gap of 7 million units. And of course, we're not building enough homes. Homes are expensive. A house normally costs three to three and a half times the median family income, but now they're up to four and a half times. And there are a lot of problems with the affordability in the housing market. The Federal Reserve has been raising rates in order to battle inflation, which has pushed mortgage rates up. And just to give you an idea, of how mortgage rates have exacerbated the housing crisis, a home that cost $500,000 two years ago with a mortgage rate of 2.86% would have a monthly payment around $1,600. But because home prices have gone up a lot, this home price is no longer $500,000, but $570,000. With a mortgage rate of about 7%, the monthly payment is now $3,000, doubling. People do not buy home prices, they buy monthly payments. And when your monthly payment doubles, you're not gonna be really looking to get into the housing market. And this is another example of opportunity because almost 40% of all homeowners have no mortgage. So number one, they're not going to sell, and then number two, they're not impacted by this mortgage rate situation that's going on. Neither are those that got in at 2%. Most of the developed world, home ownership inequality accounts for the vast majority of overall wealth inequality. So we aren't building enough. And because housing is this wealth tool, we don't want to build more in a lot of cases, which is problematic. As Maya Mandel wrote, by allowing the already rich to prevent the value of their investments from ever going down, the developed world has sleepwalked into an unenviable situation, one of stratified incomes, reduced opportunities, and worse outcomes for everyone. We've got to stop commoditizing and financializing 
every aspect of American life. Home insurance prices are through the metaphorical roof because of climate change, and people are just not selling their home. We're still 31% below pre-pandemic listing levels. And build to rent has become an increasing issue, where a lot of space is being devoted to just building rental properties. That's more of groups that are creating communities of single family homes and having a lot of success there. So that's the groups, the groups that have come in over the last five, six, seven years and are getting a lot of traction across the country. Between 2005 and 2018, the share of single family homes under construction built expressly for renting rose from 1.5% to 4.4%. By 2022, that was 8.8% of single family starts. There's always been a ton of demand and consistent demand for people that aren't going to own their home, but want to have a, a lifestyle, a community, a product type that's akin to a single family detached home and now groups are creating new communities to offer that. And renting is not necessarily a bad thing, I rent. But there comes a point in your life where it's nice to have equity. Anytime people ask for my advice, I always tell them like, do not think of, do not think of the, the purchase as an investment. Think of it as what works for me, for my life. And do I see myself in here for the next three, four, five, six, seven years? And going back to that chart of how Americans own wealth, home ownership is one of the key ways. There's a whole conversation to be had about how we can have Americans owning the businesses that they work for, at least owning a little bit, as well as owning equity. We also need policies to give people more equity. It's what I wrote in a recent New York Times op-ed about AI, mm -hmm. and one of the challenges being as productivity increases, workers should have some stock uh, in uh, tied to a company's performance. We used to do this. Sears mm -hmm. Robot, in 1919, basically used to give sales representatives some stock. And the average sales customer rep by 1968 was retiring with an income of almost a million dollars in today's terms. And then the 1980s happened. We stopped doing any uh, stock <laughs> equity for workers. Uh, and we hollowed out these companies to, to maximize shareholder return. Uh, and that's led to wealth inequality. And so the worry is that institutional investors are entering the market, they're buying up all the homes, or they're bidding on the homes, making it impossible for someone like you and I to have a fair shot. This is only happening in a few select markets, but it's happening. And so how do we fix this? One thing is building more homes, solving the issue of supply and demand. A lot of builders shifted to more entry-level product types where they were shrinking the square footages, pulling some things out of the home that maybe all the bells and whistles weren't really necessary. And so I think that's where market mechanisms work and the incentives for a builder and developer are to figure out how can I sell these homes? How can I get my price points down to get entry level buyers through the door? And that's really what they did in a lot of cases in 2023 and, and had quite a bit of success. There's also ways to manage mortgage rates that make it more stomachable for people who don't want to finance at 8%. Rate buy-downs reduce the interest rate for the entire life of the loan, and they're usually achieved by paying points up front. So a lot of people are offering this right now to try and get people to buy houses. Rates are so high, and like I said, people buy the payment, they don't necessarily buy the home price. And so you can put a certain amount of money towards it to reduce the actual mortgage rate that you're financing your home at. On the builder side, they were able to do things like I mentioned and also do rate buy downs to get a lot of entry level buyers through the door and had had one of the most phenomenal years. However, rate buy downs have some consequences on the other end too. Rate buy downs can lead to two main things, artificially inflating home prices by lowering monthly payments through these reduced rates. Rate buy downs can make homes seem more affordable, leading to an increase in demand and also increasing borrower risk because people are getting into homes that maybe they shouldn't be getting into. If you just looked at stock prices for home builders last year, just ridiculous run up. Probably sometime today. So supply and demand is one part of the issue. How do we get people to be able to buy homes in the first place? But then we have to figure out how we build homes and that comes through the changing zoning laws. Zoning laws are local or municipal regulations that dictate how property in specific geographic zones can be used. They're a key tool for city planners and local governments to shape the development of communities, but they can be really restrictive. They can prevent residential and commercial from being together. They can prevent building in certain areas that could desperately use new houses they can also do things like call parking lots historic land sites, preventing new housing from being built there as well. Zoning has also been a tool of segregation in the past, but we can fix this and they're starting to. More and more cities across the country are changing their, their zoning policies to where this was a property or a lot that could only allow for one home. They're up zoning, I think is the phrase that they're using. And so now it's going to be, we can put multiple homes on here. 
there are groups like the GSCs that are now allowing for if you have an ADU accessory dwelling unit, granny flat, people interchange those on your property. You can allow for that rental stream to be included in your qualification if you plan on renting that unit out as part of owning the home. So I think it's more of scalpel, not sledgehammer, like little things like that. I think over time are what's going to be a gradual positive for affordability and for allowing more housing to come into the system. So things like the Stop Wall Street Landlords Act are really important because they are addressing the housing crisis that we do have. It's saying, look, we have a problem and here's a way to fix it, at least one part of it. Acts like this are important because Wall Street is playing a bigger and bigger role in our lives, including buying up your local HVAC operator, buying up a nursing home around you. And I really think there needs to be attention to the apartment part of this. Single family home are the root of the American dream, but many people live in apartment complexes that are managed by uh, large institutional investors who maybe don't give a care. And they own about 50% of all apartment dwellings. And these institutional investors might stop buying up the homes without the bill. Increased building costs have led to a slowdown in investor home buying. Redfin closed their home flipping business. And so of course, maybe we should just let them do this. It's the free market, right? Stop things are a uh... A, a public policy goal. I mean, we did fight a revolution to be serfs to Wall Street. There's certain things that we want uh, public uh, space for. We have public schools. We have uh, universal health care. If someone gets sick, get hospitals have to see them. And I just don't think it's healthy to say Wall Street, just because a free market can use its billions of dollars to bid against uh, for someone who's a teacher or who's a, a janitor trying to bid, buy, buy a house. The free market isn't always free. Sometimes Boston developers pay a lot of money, like a no strings attached $750,000 donation to a local neighborhood association just after receiving approval from the city for a new development in the neighborhood. Racketeering. I think the absolute free market theory uh, has led to a lot of income disparity and the destruction of a lot of communities. I think the most interesting thing about the housing market is the concept of community. When the communities declined, where there was deindustrialization, one of the biggest challenges is communities with vacant lots, with vacant storefronts, and now you have Wall Street intentionally keeping certain homes uh, vacant. And for the most, uh, problematic is it's depriving someone from when we get there. Wall Street landlords are definitely an issue. They are buying up homes specifically in key parts of the country, making it very difficult for people to own a home. I think if we keep saying the economy is great, everything is good, uh, then it's uh, going to be a negative because people say, have you seen my rent? Have you seen that I'm not going to be able to buy a house? The main issue with the housing market is not just Wall Street landlords, it's supply and demand. We have to figure out how to address everything from the Wall Street landlords to nimbyism, to zoning, to rich parents hoarding their homes for their kids. So we don't have enough homes and we probably won't have enough homes for a while. Wall Street is there, but they're a tiny part of the overall issue, but still one that we need to address, especially with something like the Stop Wall Street Landlords Act. Basically, there just needs to be policy showing that politicians are paying attention to this and they care about the housing crisis that's happening. Because housing is the foundation of everything. If you don't have a stable home or if you're rent burden, like a lot of apartment people are, you're not going to be able to take economic risk. You're not going to be able to feel like you can start a small business. You're not going to feel like you can go back to school. And all of that goes back to the point about like, if we just built new housing, the economy could grow so much faster. The opportunity to own a home is one of the base foundations of trust and trust in society is key and building that trust back up is much harder than just building a new home.